So uh, welcome everyone. Um, I'll admit people uh, as we go along and welcome to Yulia. Um, I've been chatting to her for a bit and engaging with her on social media for a while. Always got an interesting topic and I thought this was kind of one of those topics that um, is very interesting on the forefront of business analysis, having the right mindset for this, this kind of work. So I'm not going to take much of, of Yulia's time. Um, Yulia, I'm just going to hand over to you and um, we'll, the format will be, um, you'll do a presentation, you're welcome to ask questions um, where, uh, what, um, as she's given the presentation in the chat line um, and everyone is muted so you can only uh, communicate on the chat line right now and at the end we will go through the questions. Thanks, over to you Yulia. Sounds good, thank you. Welcome everybody great to be with you. I've never been to New Zealand, so I feel like I'm almost there. Uh, so let me share my screen and uh, make sure you can see it and then get started. So we'll be sharing my um, PowerPoint. And um, let me just make sure it's in presentation mode. One second. And let me know if you can see it. Can you see the, the full screen? There we go, it's on full screen now. Perfect, wonderful. All right, so thank you everybody, welcome. Today we will talk about how to succeed in business analysis with our BA mindset. So my name is Yulia Kasarenko. I'm author of the book, Business Analyst, A Profession and a Mindset. Happily, just recently published French edition of the book for the Canadian counterparts that speak French and for everyone else who is a French speaker. And I also published a mini ebook um, called Business Analyst Mindset Digital Toolkit that has a lot of um, cartoons and uh, tips and um, poster-like pages for you if you'd like to um, share and discuss business analyst mindset in your organization. So definitely, if you're interested, give it a try. It's on Amazon and on Kobo. What we will talk about today is the mindset and what is our mindset and why is it really important? And is it important? Why are we talking about it? We will talk about 12 principles of BA mindset, how to apply them, and what to do next? What does it mean for you? How would you maybe change things? And what would you do differently? Before we do that, I really wanted to do a quick collaborative activity with you. If you don't mind, just use your phone or use another tab on your browser. Open another tab and go to menti.com. And over there, it will ask you to enter a code. So enter the seven digit code and answer one question. And this, this is a question. Just think of your most satisfying business analysis engagement, something that went really well, was really successful. What do you think helped you to be successful? So let's do that together. I'll give you a few minutes and then I'll share the results with you. Let me just keep this on screen. And um, do let me know through the chat if you have any issues with finding, with finding that, um, the mentimeter.com, and I will be sharing with you. And Paul, please fill in to add, feel free to add, and maybe I'll add a couple of more myself. Just think of what helped you to be successful. And let's then compare our notes. Can everybody see it? Let me see. Okay, I can see some questions coming back. Great. 
wonderful. I'm just gonna make sure that I'm sharing this with you. Thank you. If anybody else wants to share, what was that that helped you to be successful in that project that went really well? And I'm sharing now, and please feel free to add a few speech bubbles if you'd like. What has helped you? Support to follow a methodology, open communication, design thinking, team that's supportive to new ideas, team interested in making changes, understanding stakeholder requirements, having shared agreement, curious nature, understanding the business problems. Yeah, thank you very much. Have you noticed that there is nothing really here about requirements management tools, knowing of the technology or, you know, doing really good at uh, word processing, right? A lot of these are really about how we think and how we work. And I, I think I can safely say that a lot of these that you put forward are about our mindset. And this is really what we want to talk about today is our mindset. So really, why are we talking about it? Let's just think about business analysis and what words come to mind when we think about it. I'm thinking about stakeholders, about business analysis activities, about information that we need to process, decisions, creative thinking, all of these, it's like a really a word cloud of the, the words that come to mind. And this word cloud actually is from, from my book. But really when we talk about business analysts, it's about not just having knowledge and skills and training and having tools and techniques. It's about your motivation. And it's about your mindset. What motivates you to do the right thing and to get to that spectacular result that you were all just thinking about? So what really is a mindset? It's a particular way of thinking. It's how we make choices. It's our attitude. It's our opinions. It's the beliefs, it's believing in your own potential, it's how you work with teams, what motivates you, all of those things. It's about growth and learning. When we talk about a business analyst, there is really two sides to us. One side is more about logic and reason. When you think, oh, how is it logical? Does it make sense? You structure the information, you check things, you analyze data, you create models and diagrams, you create sequences of steps, you validate the numbers. So you can do a lot of logical things and it helps you, but that's not all. There is also some, uh, some problems that require your intuition that are about the attitude, your attitude and attitude of other people that impact the outcomes of business analysis and impact outcomes of the project. You will uh, try to understand why someone isn't listening. You're not sure what's the problem and how to agree on the problem. You uh, feel that you're getting caught up in politics. So someone is resisting um, the solution and you don't know why. You're not able to influence a certain group. You feel something is unnecessarily complicated. Someone is agreeing, but really not agreeing with you, you have some gut feels. So there is a lot of what we do that is about intuition. And that's because we are dealing with human beings. We are not dealing with just programs and sequences of activities and algorithms. We deal with people and their feelings and their emotions and their prejudices and sometimes their biases. So that's why this mindset is really important. It helps us to understand when someone is irrational and understand why they're feeling this way. It helps us to figure out how to go around someone's bias and uh, find a better solution. How to disregard the pressures and see that forest behind the trees. Um, when someone is really host hostile and conflicting, how to listen to them with open mind and try to understand what do they mean and why are they resisting? And maybe there is some truth to that how not to take things personally when you're searching for the truth. 
And, you know, sometimes just use humor when you feel that everything else fa failing. So all of these are examples where we sometimes just use your mindset when business analysis techniques and methodology are not enough. And that's why um, I came with this concept of business analyst mindset. And uh, it's put together here in 12 principles um, that you can also find on, on my website. And it's really about um, focusing on what you need to do as a business analyst, focusing on the goals of business analysis. It's about solving business problems, your customers come first, solving the right problem. It's about questioning everything. Don't just take it on trust. How you lead and facilitate. You analyze before you can come up with requirements. You uncover gaps and don't cover them up. You try to simplify before you automate anything. And you, if someone mentioned shared understanding. Take responsibility for shared understanding of business requirements. It's about how you accept and embrace business change and you're part of the solution and expecting human behavior from human beings. That's why your mindset is really important. And last but not the least is about your desire and drive to learn and adapt and thrive. So these are the really the 12 principles of business analyst mindset that we will discuss and I will go through them one by one. So just quick uh, check with Paul, are we doing okay um, in terms of the, um, was there anything in the chat? I think I lost the chat, so I'm just checking. Um, yeah, no, there's nothing in the chat yet. Um, a few more people have joined, um, but you're all good. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So let's just talk then about uh, each of the principles of the business analyst mindset. And let's start with the most important one. We need to think of business and calibrate everything we do to business goals. It's all about your clients and your clients are not your functional managers. Your client is not the project manager. Your client is that business group that you're helping solve the problems for. Whatever you do, you're doing because this client has a problem. That's who your client is. So when you're dealing with the conflicts, maybe someone questions business requirements or is thinking of scoping, or maybe you notice that solution design deviates from expectations. Whatever you do, remember who your client is. And most importantly, your client will not always be reasonable. Sometimes they'll ask for things they don't make sense. They'll, they'll have this great idea, but you realize that it's not wise or it, it's not gonna be a good use of resources. You have to speak to your clients openly and explain to them and give them good advice. And your job is to help your clients to spend their money on the right things. Now, you do want to solve the right problem. So try not to be in this situation where when number of complaints doubles, you're just coming up with improved filing system. We have to solve the right problems. If the number of complaints goes up, you need to look at why is it going up. So we always need to make sure we are solving the right problem, not the symptom, not the pain point, but the root cause. So you cannot solve the problem until you're clear what it is. Whatever customer tells you, you have to question it. And you don't know whether what they tell you is the whole story. You have to separate what is a cause and what is a symptom, what is a correlation and what is causation. And you cannot assume it, you have to investigate and analyze and look for depths and really find what that problem that needs to be solved. And remember, when one person explains what their problem is, it doesn't mean that that's what it is. We have to question things. We can't just take things on trust. So as I um, show in this cartoon, uh, if you as an analyst, I just ask to write things down you do have to ask questions. And hopefully you're never in this situation where someone tells you to stop asking questions, but that's part of your job to ask and to clarify and to find out. And again, you don't take things at face value because usually when someone has a problem, it's a pain point, it's a symptom and the underlying reason can be deep down. So we need to ask a lot of questions to resolve that ambiguity. Uh, ask questions until make, things make sense to you. Sometimes you're asking 
you're not really clear, but everyone else seems to be clear. And you may be thinking, well, I guess if everyone else is clear, I'll just write it down. They probably know what they want. But if you don't understand it, then don't go ahead. You have to understand it. So whatever is the business problem has to make sense to you. You have to ask those why questions, why whys or six whys or seven whys until you get to the root cause. And make sure that you ask clear questions because when you get the answer, you want it to be the answer to the right question. And of course, don't forget to listen to the answers. Sometimes we are so eager to ask questions that we forget a little bit to listen. So asking questions is one of those important techniques, but it's also part of your mindset to be curious and to want to find out. And um, just, just keep questioning until you are clear. The next uh, principle is about leadership and facilitation. Again, you are a business analyst. You are usually not managing the team. You're not the project manager, you're not the functional manager, but you have a great responsibility for managing that group of people working on the project. You're managing relationships. You're constantly playing intermediary between people that sometimes can't quite communicate with each other and you need to help them. You need to be a diplomat because people sometimes argue and have conflict or want different things and you need to find out well which way to go. Sometimes someone very senior to you uh, wants something that it maybe isn't reasonable and you have to figure out a very subtle and politically correct way to take them in the right direction and maybe give them a little hint and nudge to help them make better decisions. You need to influence people without criticizing them. When you listen, you have to listen with empathy because sometimes you might think that someone is doing something that really doesn't make sense but again, there may be a reason why. You may need to deal with sensitive issues and sometimes you need to deliver bad news. For example, what you're asking for is not possible. So all of this again is dealing with human beings. It's, uh, there's no rule, set rules. Uh, you have to play it by ear and you have to work with those different personalities. And this hat stand is just some of the hats that you are going to have to wear because you will have to be devil's advocate sometimes and help people to change and lead them and mediate between their conflicts and facilitate meetings and help people work together. So this side of your job is one of the most challenging, but without that, um, nothing else is gonna happen. Very important part of that is facilitating meetings. And uh, whether it's workshops or user story meetings or uh, user story mapping, whatever it is you use. Uh, these are meetings of people. And the goal of meetings is to get people together to make certain decisions. So when you facilitate meetings, uh, you are responsible for using time of these people respectfully and efficiently. You always need to figure out is the meeting required? If it's not really required, don't waste anybody's time. What are the objectives? What are the goals? making sure you invite the right people. Again, if someone doesn't need to be there, respect their time, let them do something else. You have to learn how to manage those hostile stakeholders or those that resist. Uh, sometimes the most difficult time you will have with them is in the meetings where there is a lot of people and someone is being negative. You have to figure out how to deal with them. But again, this is the key. Don't forget to listen to them. Sometimes these negative stakeholders have a good reason to be negative. Maybe that will be the only person who will tell you the truth about something that will not work. And everyone else is kind of, ah, too shy, I'm not gonna mention that. So listen to them because uh, I actually, I do have an experience when someone was extremely negative in the beginning and then turns out they had a really bad previous project experience and a lot of their time was wasted on requirements that never went to had. Once you listen, you actually may find a way to work together. And it always is better than remaining negative. Whenever you have a meeting, please be prepared. It's your meeting. Uh, you have to know exactly what you want. You have to have all the materials. You have to ask people who need to be prepared, explain what is needed. Make sure you use that time efficiently, especially if it's a requirements analysis meeting or a requirements walkthrough or problem solving. 
you can't just start from the blank slate. You need to be prepared. You need to have a plan and you need to make sure that again, that time is used wisely. Effective facilitation, many books written about it, many articles, there are so many tips and tricks to just facilitating that meeting and making it flow and helping when people get stuck and moving it along when someone gets uh, that discussion into a corner and doesn't want to come out. You need to learn how to park issues that clearly cannot be solved. You need to assign actions and keep moving forward. All of this, again, is key to uh, using that hour, those two hours effectively. And lastly, um, record but don't slow the discussion down and follow up. So here is where you are like a project manager. If you host a meeting, then it's your meeting to determine what actions are, follow up and explain to everyone what's expected of them. Because facilitating meetings is a big part of business analyst's job. And also as some analysts say, or some stakeholders say it's the biggest time waste if business analyst is not efficient. The next one is, really about analysis. Why do we say business analysis? We don't say that it's a job of a scribe. It's not a job of someone who's documenting requirements. It's business analysis. We have to analyze the problem before we can synthesize the requirements. We have to gather information before we will actually uh, know what are we supposed to do. What you're given by your stakeholders is information. It's not necessarily the requirements that they give you. They think they do, but to you, it's information that you need to process and analyze and compare to information you get from other sources and compare it to data and compare it to other documentation before you understand what the real problem is. So requirements do not come from business. Requirements come from business analysis. You have to ask questions. You have to immerse yourself in the process to do some artifact analysis and root cause analysis and process analysis and modeling and create diagrams. You have to do all of these things to analyze what you are hearing and to figure out what to solve. You will not be given requirements by stakeholders. They'll just explain to you, this is what's wrong. This is what I don't like. This is what everybody hates. It's not necessarily requirements yet. It's information you need to do your analysis, to do your job, and then to synthesize the requirements. All right, I'm gonna let you look at this comic first before talking. Now, anyone, tell me you've never been in this situation. Honestly, anyone? I just have to figure out how to bring back the chat that I lost. But tell me that you've never been in a situation where someone said, no, 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 let's not go there. You know, we can't deal with it. And then it just blows up in your face. I think everyone has been in that situation. If you discover something on the project and it looks weird and mm, I'm not sure that will work or there is someone who is just saying that it's not going to work or you have that nagging feeling that you haven't really analyzed enough and that that gap explodes later and it turns out to be a big deal that's a gap and our job is to detect gaps and not ignore them and if you find a gap it is a success it's not a failure it is a success if you found the gap during requirement stage you don't want to find it during implementation. You don't want it to blow up after you rolled out your solution to thousands or millions of users. You want to find it while you're still doing analysis because then you have a chance to fix it. So you have to, it's your job to log any gap you find as a risk, even if it cannot get addressed for whatever reason, it has to be logged. It has to be explored. Understand what the background is. What's the root cause? What is the business impact? And then, don't make a decision yourself by hiding it or ignoring it. Let it be a group decision. What are the pros and cons? What are the risks? What are the costs? Can you mitigate it? Can you be prepared for it? Just like any risk a management exercise that you're doing on the project. It's just that you as a business analyst are in that unique position where you could be the only person who is really seeing that gap because everyone else 
Uh, like a regular user may not even realize what's the gap, but you will be able to see that. So please, please do not cover up the gaps, document them, discuss them, do not create secrets, okay? It's not, uh, again, you don't wanna get into politics and hide secrets in secret files. It's a risk, it needs to be assessed, it may not be fixed, but at least someone is making an informed decision about it. All right, anyone has seen um, a process flow, a swim lane diagram that went all around the wall and wrapped around on the other wall? I have, and nobody could read them and nobody could understand them. And someone would work so hard and create this beautifully detailed diagram. And it was so complicated that nobody could really understand what was going on. So the automation of that process would just go ahead the way it's been depicted without really analyzing what makes sense in the process. So as business analysts, we have to always look for ways for simplifying something that is too complicated. Now, some process may need to be complex just because of the nature of the business, but more often than not, we find something that is just complicated for various reasons. It got complicated over time. People add things, uh, they add manual steps, they add workarounds. They sometimes come up with this um, political uh, reasons why they need to do process this way and not that way. And then people change places and people move around, but this unoptimized process, suboptimal process stays and nobody remembers anymore. Why are we doing things this way? So really always think before you automate every activity, every action, every process, does this serve a business goal? Does it provide value? Why are we doing this? Do we need all these handoffs in the process? Is the subflow really uh, has to be so long and tedious? Can it be optimized? How many approvals do you really need? Do you really, can you minimize the number of approvals? What about all those really complex decisions where you have a diamond with so many arrows coming up of your decision diamond? Can you make this decision simpler? Maybe if you use better data. What about those bottlenecks where things slow down? Can they be avoided? So there is a lot of business process improvement techniques specifically for processes that you can apply. If you are interested in data, if that's one of your strengths, there is more and more uh, tools and um, methodologies that use process mining where um, special tools analyze existing process to determine and flag for you the bottlenecks and the slowdowns. There's many ways for you to find what needs to be optimized. So the never optimize sub automate suboptimal process because you will just magnify the inefficiency and that inefficiency will be then baked in your software or in your application. Always look for automating and for simplifying. And this little links uh, in my presentation, if you get a copy then, it also takes you to um, articles on, on these topics, by the way. Now, this is my favorite. Take responsibility for shared understanding of business requirements. Can I please see requirements? Oh, I'll show you when you're done. Don't, I, I don't want to confuse you. Uh, again, I have seen it before where the analyst is just secretly working on this huge document or on 25,000 user stories. Maybe I'm exaggerating a little, but just works and works and works and collects information and processes them without really sharing with others because they only want to share the perfect product. And then three months later, the perfect pro product is shared in a big walkthrough and nobody recognizes their requirements. They say, that's not what we asked for. Wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. Again, shared understanding of business requirements is a process. It takes time. It's like a journey. And you have to do the journey from the very beginning. As you go, you have to share whatever you are doing as you go in the draft, you have to constantly validate, iterate, check, review. You have to understand what the context is. And again, keep iteratively adding to that context. You have to 
make sure that your terminology is consistent and constantly check with everyone else. Is that the right word? Do you understand what I mean? Does everyone have the same understanding? Keep explaining what you, what you capture many ways because your stakeholders will have different ways of uh, learning information and of processing information. Someone wants to read your document. Someone wants to see the diagram. Someone really needs to see the data. You may have people who are happy to read requirements on their own, but someone wants to have a discussion. So you need to figure out how to engage your stakeholders in this process of validation and of understanding, because without this shared understanding, who cares that your requirements are perfect? You may write that perfect document or 200 user stories that would pass any hiring test and are satisfying all of the rules of user stories and their quality and the acceptance criteria there. And you think that you've done a fantastic job but if no one else agrees with that or shares the same understanding or they thought that we were all doing something different, well, that's useless, right? Because you need to solve the problem or you need to satisfy expectations of your stakeholders. You cannot do it without constantly validating and reviewing and structuring so that everyone can get the shared understanding. It's so well structured, it's so well described, it's discussed in many ways so that you actually have the same idea about what everyone is building. So we business analysts won't have a job if not for changes. If organizations didn't need to change, who needs a business analyst? We are fine, we just keep doing what we've always been doing. The only reason we have living and we are making careers is because businesses need to change. So if you want to get on a new project, you're happy that there is a change happening, right? It's new and exciting. And you as a business analyst want to get in and help your stakeholders develop this new product or implement this new system or figure out new ways of communicating with customers. You're very happy about the change. You work on those requirements. But then later you say, oh, oh, that's that's it. You can't change anything now. This is what we've agreed on. Don't change it. We're implementing this and then submit a change request. And hopefully that um, thinking is has been changing with more iterative approaches to software development life cycle. But it's still it's still quite prevalent. A lot of organizations are still waterfall or waterfallish. A lot of business analysts are told by their project managers, don't accept it any requirements changes because we just have this deadline or we cannot do this. And even if you do an iterative and a sprint approach, there is sometimes this uh, thought that, okay, if you've developed something, they really shouldn't be redoing it, even though it is one of the ideas of uh, agile methodologies to test and learn and change. So here is the thing. Change is a reality. It's never gonna go away. And again, if it does go away, then we're all out of jobs. So change is inevitable. Whether we face it or whether we ignore it, it's gonna be there. So we have to accept changes and assess them all the time. If there is a change in business environment or if the type of the customer changes or if your executive management changed and now they have new direction or if there is another system being implemented that suddenly starts to impact your system, or oh, many, many reasons, just assess it. What's the value? What's the impact? What's the risk? Do you need to react to this change? Do you need to make any adjustments to the solution design that is already in the works? So whatever happens later, just like with gaps, your job is not to make a decision and shut it off. Identify what are those requirements? Look at the options within that work in progress. If work is in progress, what can be done? What's the minimum that can be done to adapt to this change? What is the full solution? What is a partial solution? What is a workaround? And then your job again is to make your client happy. Help your client to make the right decision, but not an emotional decision. And not like, no, 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 you're not allowed to. They need to make decisions based on all of these value, impacts, risks. And you as business analysts are in that position that helps them to really um, 
assess it with the data and with the information that is needed. I'll let you read this one for a moment. Again, um, I'm curious, and if you don't mind dropping in the chat and I'll, I'll get access to that later. I'm curious how many of you have experienced this when as soon as you deliver the requirements, which is your main deliverable, you are allocated to another project and you don't really know what's happening with the baby anymore. So you've, um, you've got those requirements done. Maybe you've spent three months or four months or five months or how much time. And then suddenly you realize that you don't know what's been happening after that. And sometimes it's not your choice. Sometimes you just didn't realize that you were supposed to do things, but you are part of the solution even after requirements are completed. And even when someone tells you that you just have one deliverable requirements, it is not so. So again, I'm going back to what I said before, and it may sound a little harsh, but excellent requirements are not a goal. Who cares about excellent requirements if they don't get executed and if they don't get translated to a beautiful solution? Nobody cares. So if I am a customer, I don't care about requirements. I want my solution to work the way I want it to work. I want my problem solved. I want my product. I want my automation. I want my communication with customers. I want my new website. And the fact that you've done excellent requirements does not matter if I don't get my working implemented solution. So you as analysts don't just create requirements for the beginning of the project. You need to recognize and analyze and manage new requirements, those changes, whether it's iterations or new phase or whether you use agile approach. You're constantly managing requirements. You are validating the solution. Someone else may be designing the solution, but you need to be part of that solution design review and you need to be interested and passionate and you want that to be a good solution because otherwise you'll feel betrayed, like your requirements didn't result in a good solution. That's not good. So a best a project that I've been on, I was just there in the middle. We would have the solution design, passionate discussions and arguments, but we collectively came up with a better solution and it, it, it was satisfactory. It was, it was enjoyable to see that happen. Now this, component here, I cannot say enough about it. Solution to a business problem is not just an application. It's not just a technology component. It's not just software changes. Every single business change includes some non-technology components. It may be documentation, training, uh, process changes, um, different templates different designs on the website, changing the colors. It, it could be so many things. It could be different format of the letters or different envelopes that need to be ordered. There's always some kind of non-technology components that are there. And you as business analysts are responsible for requirements for non-technology components as well, not just for system requirements. And often you need to help implement those maybe oversee or maybe remind everyone that that needs to be done and maybe sometimes even do. The other part of your job is communicating, explaining and training. People need to be with you. That shared understanding of requirements need to go through the solution design stage and development and training and implementation stage. So you will need to explain and communicate again and again to the new people that join the project as changes happen, as you move into the new project phase, it is part of your job. Sometimes you need to train the trainers that will then turn end users. You will be supporting change management, maybe user adoption, capturing, transferring the knowledge and seeing them implementation, seeing that warranty period, looking at the feedback from users. That also helps you validate whether your requirements are good. So that whole life cycle of a solution, not necessarily even of a project, but the life cycle of a solution is part of your job. Maybe you're not as heavily involved, but you need to be involved. And it's, it's good for you to see how your requirements that you help create get translated into something that's working. 
All right, last week you said this scenario will never happen. Yeah, I guess I was feeling optimistic. I totally forgot it happened before. We sometimes get surprised that humans behave like humans. They forget things. They forget to mention things. They don't think something is important. They are emotional. They keep secrets. They are biased. They don't believe that something good will come out of this. There's many reasons why people don't act rationally. They are human beings. And by the way, you also don't always act rationally. I'm sure you can come up with a few examples. You also have your emotions. You have your personality. So we all are human beings. And when you as business analysts do your job, it's a constant social activity. You work with people. You work with their biases. You work with their misconceptions. You get surprised by how they behave, but you should not be surprised. So you work with people, you help solve problems created usually by people, and you're gonna create solutions that will be used by people. So it's all about people and understanding them. So really you have to pay attention to what people say. And sometimes you have to pay attention to what people not say, because sometimes it's, it's what they don't say that make, can make or break project. That gap that you were talking about, that maybe was something that nobody told you about, that you didn't even realize was important, or maybe there was some negative stakeholder and you didn't really want to listen to them because they were being negative. But sometimes it's what they don't say that will have impact. If you are getting into a conflicting situation, think about options, negotiate, consider those points of view. Sometimes you need to be patient and slow down. Sometimes you just rush through and please don't do that in a requirements walkthrough, right? I've, I've been in some requirements walkthroughs um, in my architecture days where a business analyst just comes in and can read super fast, like a, a very fluent reader and just reads and reads and reads and reads so fast that they can't even hear anything. Please don't do that, okay? Your job again is to create shared understanding. So slow down, explain, make people comfortable, make them listen to you, make them hear you. If someone has a, a doubt, have a frank conversation with them, understand why. At some point, you have to stand your ground and you may disagree with someone else. Keep calm when you deal with conflicts, you will be getting with the conflicts. It's inevitable. Again, uh, you will always be in the middle of these arguments because requirements arguments are probably, you know, the the most um, intense. Let's just say the more intense discussions can only be when something is about to be discussed or what priorities are discussed. But you will get into situations where there are two sides that cannot agree, and you will have to use data and logic and politics and diplomacy to try and resolve these arguments and conflicts. And again, don't forget about humor. Sometimes you just need to use humor when you see that nothing else is working. All right, learn, adapt and thrive. And I've heard someone say, you don't need to understand why. When you ask, why do you need to do this way? Just do what I say. No, you need to understand why. When you're a business analyst, you need to understand why, why is this a problem? Why is this working or not working? You need to understand the industry. You need to understand the domain. You have to learn. And this is the best part of the job that you always have a chance to learn. You come into the new company, you learn about the new project, you learn about new side of the business. It can take you in any career direction afterwards, but this is what really makes you um, enjoy every day because it's always something new happening. It's never boring. Okay, so learn new industries, learn domain expertise become expert in specific technology, you know, maybe brush up on mass and logic and statistics. Maybe you are going to be interested in decision intelligence. Maybe you want to specialize in non-functional domain, like user experiences. There's so much expertise now and it's so needed. 
go deeper into the data analysis or systems analysis, or maybe you wanna become an architect. There is always, always directions in which you can go and business analysis give you that chance to explore many of those. So uh, just think about all of the skills and techniques that are out there that are definitely there for you again to learn and adapt and improve. There are books, there are blogs, uh, there is model and standards, there is professional organizations. There are so many resources for you to learn the techniques from and methodologies and maybe learn a new model and tool and get some examples of fancy charts, definitely. But don't forget about your mindset because that's what sometimes you need in most difficult situations. How do you focus on what's important? Again, important for your client, important for the success of the project. How do you listen and hear what's going on and really hear it? Practicing empathy, understanding those human beings, understanding your clients, understanding someone who's upset or someone doesn't want to do something. How do you look beyond obvious? Again, someone will bring you the problem on a beautiful plate and say, it's ready to go. These are my requirements. Sometimes you need to look beyond that and ask why and ask why and keep asking. And you may discover something underneath that needs to be solved. How do you learn from your mistakes? Don't get upset. You will make mistakes just like everybody else because you are human. How are you learning from that? taking pride of your work and seeing those requirements to the successful implementation and staying interested in the success of what you have designed or helped design, helping to implement it and then checking out on how is it going. And this is really where, where it comes down to sometimes standing up for what you believe in and saying, hey, the emperor, I think is naked and saying, this doesn't make sense when nobody else wants to say it. This is sometimes what business analysts need to do. Sometimes it's the most uncomfortable position you will find yourself in because you may see this group of people who all want to go in this direction and you don't think it's right. How do you speak up and how do you rationally explain your point of view and perhaps at least have them listen? That's sometimes the hardest because we, again, we can all come up with examples of a project or solution that didn't go in the right direction because nobody spoke up. So it's part of your job to be a bastion of common sense and think about what makes sense and speak up. All right, I'm not gonna talk about myself, but if you're interested in, um, other resources that I have to share, you can definitely get them. Um, I have a blog and the website called White Change and um, a YouTube channel called White Change. So you're welcome to visit that anytime or check out my book. But I really wanna make sure that there is some time for us to exchange questions and answers. So just chat about what you've heard and see what you think. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thanks, Julia. That uh, was really interesting. Um, I was interested to see your your slide and all the books. And just to let everyone know, a lot of those books, if you're a member of the IBA, you actually can get them free online in the digital library in IBA. And that's the only little marketing punt I'm going to give today on the IBA. Um, you know, I kind of, I've, I've, I've unmuted everyone because it's more than enough group for us to allow people to ask their questions. And I thought I'd just um, start off with um, a question that kind of popped out to me towards the end there. Um, I mean, you talk about having the guts to stand up for what you believe in and, and, that, and, and it's interesting because I've done that twice. Well, I have, sorry, let me rephrase, I've done that and twice in my career, I've been taken off a project because of doing that. And once was where I said, uh, we've done a solution, but we don't know what the requirements are. And I was removed off the project and one when I asked, what problem are you solving? Because I don't, get it and I was removed. I mean, what's, what's the sort of the balance you want to do there? Or I mean, should you be comfortable saying, well, I'm going to stand up for what I believe, but I could be removed? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's never an easy challenge. I actually had a similar experience where I was a business analyst on a project. And then as soon as I started asking questions, someone went and talked to my boss and said, 
tell her to stop analyzing our requirements. We know what we want. And in fact, they didn't. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a fine, it's a, I guess it's a double-edged sword and it's a fine, thin red line to walk for sure. I guess one point is you need to know who are your potential allies. You're never completely alone. And I think that's one of those things that sometimes I speak in webinars where business analysts ask me, oh, what if I do this? Or what if I don't get that? Start with the fact that you are never alone. You're always part of the team. And as you start working on the team, you, you have to get that feel of who are your allies, who thinks like you. And you know, if it's your project manager, fantastic. I guess it's not always this case if it's your one of the business sponsors. So first of all, do you get, do you have anybody's support at all? If you if you do, definitely that helps. Second, um, it's it's never it cannot be emotional thing. You have to make it rational. You have to have arguments. Ideally, maybe you have data. So in my case, for example, I had this. Um, oh, we really have to go this way. This is a scenario. This is a solution. Sometimes you don't argue, you just go back and you ask, say, um, someone on a data site to pull up some data and then track what is actually happening, for example, in production and say, well, look, if you go this way, here are, are the numbers added up, this is what you will get. If you go this way, this is what you will get. Sometimes you can use data for that. Again, not always. Sometimes you... Um, you just have to do it in writing because we as human beings are not always complete diplomats, right? We sometimes our face and I am guilty of it. My face sometimes shows when I think that something is, is not smart, it will show up on my face and it's not, it's not good. So sometimes you need to put your recommendations in writing with pros and cons and kind of, you know, have it this way, it's less painful. So it, there's no clear cut. But I would say that think if you if you don't speak up and it all goes ahead, like how you know how would you feel? What if you truly are the only person who understands it? Maybe they really don't know. If they do know, but they make that decision for other reasons, you know, then again that's different. So use your I guess analysis skills as much as you can. Yeah. Um, everyone's unmuted. Um... And if you've got a question, please go ahead and ask a question. Um, otherwise, I'll do a follow-up question. Anyone got a question? Um, Yulia, Peter here. Um, how do you manage situations whereby your bottom is a BA, but the solution has already been decided and you're just there basically to do uh, just some paperwork? And as you're going through the analysis, you kind of figure out that, okay, so the solution has just been discussed. They just want me to document the requirements, but maybe they've already chosen SAP as the solution or some other vendor. How do you go about walking that out? Or if you find yourself in that situation, how do you manage that? Yeah, I think that, I think there are two sides to it. One, the, the platform for solution has been chosen like Salesforce or SAP or anything else. And the other is if requirements uh, have already been captured and, and I guess the design is there. I think with the, with the platform, uh, you don't really have as much leeway because often those decisions are made at the enterprise architecture level. There is a certain um, um, economical considerations, but uh, the same platform can be implemented so many ways. So the platform may be chosen, but the question is, do you still have leeway in defining how this platform needs to be considered? That's one part. The other part of course is, as you say, if everything has been decided and they just ask you to document it and capture it. So I would say that maybe it's just something you need to do if, if it's your assignment but you always have to probe and see uh, whether things make sense. If you see something that doesn't make sense, again, see, is there any ally? Is it anyone who is interested? Hey, look, this scenario, I don't think it's gonna work because of here and here. Uh, so you have to test the waters and see how receptive people are. I think if it's, again, you're looking at your own position, how stable is your position? 
if your position is stable and you're okay, you're feeling confident, you may just capture your feedback in writing and see who to send it to. Because again, um, sometimes people don't listen, but maybe they will read if something is on paper. And just, just test whether, whether you can send it to the right people. Sometimes it comes down to that. And honestly, sometimes uh, these um, decisions are made not maliciously, not because someone you know, is, uh, is just, um, just wants to get things their way. They honestly believe that this is the best solution and they know what they want. And in that case, you may actually get people to listen to you, but start by asking questions. Is this what you meant? Is this what you really wanted? Can I walk with you through the expected results if we do what this requirement says? This is what you're gonna get. Is this what you want? So sometimes just illustrating the outcome may show that this was not the right requirement if, it's, if it was an honest mistake, right? Okay. Thanks for that. Yeah. Yeah, it's never simple. Paul, you're no, muted. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, I forgot about that. Um, yeah, so uh, anyone else got a question? We've got four minutes, so I think we can take one or two questions before we wrap up today. Otherwise, I'll just close with a follow-up question. Okay, I'll take that silence that no one else has a question. Um, so, Yule, there was an interesting comment placed in the chat line earlier by Anna from Auckland. Um, and she was talking about uh, in her experience as a UX designer um, working with something and then later on when the products actually de delivered it's not what the original idea and the content was um i know i've i mean i've been in that experience as well um what's your thoughts and kind of how handy that kind of situation yeah uh I mean, um, sometimes we don't get involved in design, right? And sometimes yeah. we have no way of getting involved and it kind of moves out of our hands. And I don't know whether your experience was um, that it was a vendor who was developing it. Like you just hand off your requirements and then it goes kind of beyond the wall and you don't know what's happening to them. So <laughs> I've had this experience too, let's just say. And um, one thing is, I guess, asking in, in the beginning of engagement, will I get involved in solution design? Will we have a chance or suggestion? Can we review the mock-ups? Can we review the, um, the work in progress? Ideally, if this is a vendor who is doing it, for example, even if you're not completely agile working with a vendor, which sometimes just isn't possible because of contractual obligations, but you can have an agreement about a regular demonstrations, for example, demos and um, uh, reviews of work in progress. And then as an, if you stay involved as an analyst, it's part of your job to identify that something isn't matching, is deviating and assess it. And again, you always have to assess it, pros and cons. They may come up with a better design because like, to be honest, I, for example, I'm really bad at design. My design is all like 90s style, right? The, the first the first html and i'm like sometimes i look at it and say, oh my god that looks so outdated so we may we may not be as good about about the design as we think we are but we might we might be wonderful and talented and someone is just ignoring it and again as was was design it's like was art right there's no no to write solutions so i would say that the best you can always do is try to stay involved in that solution cycle insert yourself, make some friends, say, hey, I'll, I'll help you, Ryu. would you like me to do a demo? Can I please see the demo? I'm so excited to see it. And just trying to be friendly and um, in that friendly way, stay involved and then maybe drop a comment or maybe someone will ask for your opinion. So you just have to be involved um, as much as you can or suggest that you should be involved. <laughs> I think it's, we're going to call it a wrap there. Um, it's almost one o'clock. Um, thanks, you, you, Yulia, and thanks to everyone who attended. Um, so the recording will be available next week sometime on the YouTube channel for the IBA in New Zealand. Uh, welcome to go there and have a look. Um, I will post on LinkedIn as well a link to it. So um, thank you, Yulia. Thank you to everyone and enjoy the rest of your day.